morning for a start off uh, in our Bible study. We're studying the local church, and I'd like you to ask uh, to join me in Third John. Just to start with this morning, we're going to be reading some passages in the Old Testament and concluding with some passages in the New Testament this morning. I want to ask all of you young people, all you kids and young people, what do you want to be when you grow up? Older. Older. Okay. But you're already there, Helen. <laughs> I was asking the kids. <laughs> That was a slap in the face, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, what do you want to be when you grow up? Has anybody thought about it? What? What do you want to be, Carl Blair? You want to be a policeman. What do you want to be? A fireman. Does anybody want to be a housewife? I was actually talking to the girls. Any of you girls want to be a, a good mother and a loving wife? Uh, nobody? We're in bad shape here. Does any of you guys want to, if you get married, do you want to be a really good dad and a good father? Eh? I hope you do. you got to practice. you got to spend your whole life preparing if you get married to be that. And if, if you don't get married, you know there's lots of kids that need somebody to be a dad or a mom to them. Eh? Lots and lots of kids have only a mom and they don't have a dad and they need somebody in their life to help them and to be a, a good mentor to them. Well, this is something to be thinking about because you have to plan to be a a good parent and a good spouse and uh, a good example and a good influence and you have, there are a lot of things you have to watch out for because you can get messed up if you just do what comes natural and follow the crowd you have to make choices to obey God and that's really what we're talking about this morning the church needs qualified leaders we need young men to purpose when they're young like Daniel and his friends I will do the right thing in my life. I will be different, and I will make the choices necessary, and when the time comes, I will stand. Third John in the Bible is one of the shortest books in the Bible. And let's read it together this morning. Third John. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, even as you walk in the truth. So, John the Apostle was writing this to a man who was a Christian leader, and uh, John was giving him kudos. He was saying, doing a great job, Gaius. You're a good example. You're holding to the line and you're doing the right thing. Verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatsoever you do to the brethren and to strangers which have borne witness of your love before the church whom if you bring forward on their journey after a godly sort you shall do well because that for his name's sake they the strangers the people that go around serving the lord they went forth taking nothing of the pagans or the gentiles we christians therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither does he himself receive the brethren, and forbids them that would, and casts them out of the church. Beloved, Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that does good is of God, but he that does evil has not seen God. Demetrius, on the other hand, has good report of all men and of the truth itself. 
Yea, and we also bear record, and you know that our record is true. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write to you. But I trust I shall shortly see you, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to you, our friends salute you, greet the friends by name. There are um, three men mentioned in this little tiny book in the Bible. Uh, two of them were godly, faithful leaders, and one was a, um, a counterfeit spiritual leader, someone that should not be in spiritual leadership. Did you know, folks, the churches across this land today and across the world are facing the same challenges as in the first century? In the first century, the Christians wrestled with leadership issues, and in the 21st century, Christians are still, local churches are still wrestling with leadership issues. The search is on for good men. It always has been. And I don't just mean men, but good, faithful believers who will take responsibility in the home. You know, Paul told Timothy to teach the Christians, the husbands, to tell their wives to uh, guide the house, to take responsibility in the home. That doesn't mean dominate the husband, but it does mean Take charge and make sure your home is a model of order and cleanliness and godliness and charity and faithfulness. And the husband is to be the head of the wife and they're to work together as a team. There is order, but women are not just sex objects. They're not just things. They're not last on the list. In God's mind, they are partners together in faith. And... Um, Today, our culture is getting this all backwards. I'm going to say something here, and some of you might get mad at me, but I think that if fewer women worked, that would provide more job opportunities for men. It would reduce unemployment. Mothers would be more available for their children and be have more time for their husbands. See, our culture is really on the skids. And that's just one illustration of how bad it is. I got a magazine yesterday. I was sitting on my table. I don't know where it came from. I guess it came in the mail. And, uh, and uh, here we've got a list of all the church leaders that are promoting this particular alpha program. And on the back page I opened up, and here's this woman who is the Bishop of Edmonton. My friends, the Bible plainly says that women are not to take leadership positions in the church. Not over men. The, the, the Bible just says it in black and white. But today, evangelicals, or people who call themselves Bible-believing Christians, reject the plain teaching of the Word. Women are now taking responsibility. They're preachers and pastors and spiritual leaders over men. Men become the passive uh, people in the pews, not accepting their responsibility, and it's backwards. It's backwards. The search is on for good men. John wrote to... Uh, a good man in the first century, his name was Gaius, and he commended him and said, now look, in your church, I know for a fact there are two guys. One is a, 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 an imposter, and the other is a faithful leader. Now teach the people in your church to follow the good and to reject the evil. You know what we're talking about here this morning? Church leadership issues are not a matter for a few good men. It's a collective responsibility in every community and in every local assembly. Because if the people in the pews would not follow bad leaders, the bad leaders would have nobody to dominate. It's your responsibility to wake up, smell the coffee, stop being apathetic, stop shrugging your shoulders and say we can't do anything about it, become aware and informed and in any church you go to, make waves. <laughs> any church you're in, insist on righteousness. That's the point. John wrote and said, people should not follow diatrophies. The guy is a dominator. He's a manipulator. He's a controller. He is uh, unrighteous. He does not want good people to come into this church and influence the flock. He wants to dominate the flock. And anybody that would like to have other people come in, itinerant preachers to preach the Word of God, he gets on their case and he prevents them from having that influence in the church. He was really a bad, bad news dude. All right. 
You know, the church and God's people, not just the church, but down through the history of Israel, has struggled with these leadership issues. What I want to do this morning is to stress the point that churches need qualified leaders. But it's not just a matter for a few. This is supposed to be a collective sense of responsibility. I don't believe that churches should elect their leaders. I don't believe that's the biblical model. I think leaders should be appointed by other qualified leaders. That's the biblical model. Pastoral leadership is very different than democratic principles. However, that does not mean that people have no responsibility. In fact, it's the exact opposite. This church and all the people in it have collective responsibility to know what the principles for and the qualifications for godly leadership are, number one. Number two, they should be personally aware of it. They should be willing to hold to the standard and hold leaders accountable to the standard. And you have a responsibility to complain or to turn away or to reject bad leadership. That's the bottom line. Never forget it. We haven't preached that very much from here, but the, I'm telling you, this is when it comes down to the way it works, this is the way it should work. And someday you will find yourself in a church where there is bad leadership, guaranteed, because it's all over the place today. And if you don't see some, if you see something is not done right, you can make waves. You can admonish. You can confront. Now it does say in Second Timothy. No, 1 Timothy chapter 5, that an accusation should not be brought to, before an elder except in the face of witnesses. You, don't, you haven't got the right to create an, a spirit of insubordination and rebellion in a local church in an underhanded fashion. There are proper procedures to follow to deal with someone who is erring in leadership. But you must follow them. <laughs> you must care. Right? And if more people would agitate for righteousness in churches where leaders are politicking and when leaders are immoral or leaders are not preaching the truth, then those people would be held accountable. And it would be better. Sometimes it has to get worse before it gets better. Okay? It's kind of like surgery, right? You got something wrong with you? It's got to, you got to go through the pain to make it better. Right? And the same thing in the household of faith. So, number one today, what we're doing in our scripture study is stressing the responsibility for collective responsibility for your leaders. At the same time, I want to balance that off with reminding all of us that there are very stringent guidelines and standards for spiritual leaders and we don't have the right to pick and choose which ones we want and which ones we don't like we just must accept the package deal this is what god gave us let's accept it let's hold to this standard whether we like it or not whether we understand it or not okay and let's 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 be faithful to the standards there is this balance last sunday the emphasis that i preached in this pulpit was that every church needs a uh, strong, united leadership, a collective leadership, but at the same time, leadership is not distinct from laity. There is no clergy-laity thing. This is a, a false invention of leaders that has gone on for thousands of years in Christendom. What we need is to get rid of this clergy-laity thing and recognize that we're all sheep under Jesus, the shepherd. Leaders are sheep, and the non-leaders are sheep. We're all sheep. We're answerable to Jesus Christ who is the chief shepherd, the great shepherd, the good shepherd. Alright? That's not to say we all have the same role. And so some people in the church have leadership roles, but everybody has a spiritual gift. And the universal responsibility of every member of this local body and every local body around the world is to get on the ball and use your gift. Stir up the gift that is in you, Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy was apathetic. He was lax. He was fearful. He was timid. Come on, get off your rear end and get moving. That is the message that all of us must take. That's what I preached last week. This week, I want to shift focus just a little bit. You have a spiritual gift, but you need to be aware of the kind of leadership your local church must have. Okay? You are somewhat responsible for the kind of leadership your church must have. 
You must be aware of the standards. You must be willing to join all the rest of the people in the assembly to hold to the standard. You should insist on the standard. You should insist on righteousness. And you need to pray for your leaders. And you need to reject bad leadership. Just turn away from it. Say, I will not follow that man. And you need to embrace a good leader. That's the biblical responsibility. Jesus had compassion on the lost people of his day because they had no true shepherds. The leaders of Israel, by and large, with one or two exceptions, we can only think of two names probably, or three names at the time, were false shepherds. The shepherds of Israel were a lousy lot. They had been for centuries. This is no new story. As Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. Well, the church was a new thing. Solomon didn't foresee that. Okay? So the church is operating today. We have God in heaven. We have his people on earth. And they're doing something for him. Shining his lights. Before the church, there was Israel. God in heaven. God's people on earth. In the nation of Israel, they were to be lights among the nations. They failed miserably. Why? Because the people did not hold to the standard. They were not taught the word of God by their leaders. Their leaders were a lousy lot. And the people just... It was like it was um, tit for tat, right? They got some bad leaders. The people turned away from the... And the people's hearts went after the world. And then they didn't support their leaders. And then the leaders had to go and flee to their gardens. Or they had to compromise their principles to survive. And we read that sad story through thousands of years of Old Testament history. Turn with me to Judges chapter 2. This is an per all-pervading principle of Scripture that we're talking about here. Collective responsibility to hold your spiritual leaders accountable and to demand good leadership. Judges chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. This is after the days of Joshua, after they had gone in and conquered the promised land. They got settled in their property and then they put their feet up, crossed their arms, drank their wine, <laughs> and uh, ate, drank, and be merry. Uh, they just kind of let down their guard and said, we want to be comfortable. Joshua chapter 2, verse 11. And as soon as we had... Sorry, I'm in Joshua. Excuse me just for a moment. Judges chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. And the land had rest 40 years. Man, I'm having a hard time this morning. That's chapter 3. <laughs> I'll get it together yet. Pray for me. <laughs> Judges 2.11 And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baalim. You know what Baalim is? Many Baals. You know what Baal is? A filthy, rotten, false god. Idol. Every town had their Baal. Every village had their Baal. And they would set up an idol under a under the highest place in town, under a tree, and they would practice ritual religious prostitution in service to Baal and Ashtarah. The plural of Ashtarah is Ashtoreth. The plural of Baal is Baalim. This was like porno on the internet. This is exactly the way it was in the culture. Everywhere, it was everywhere. It was everywhere. This was religious, okay? If you do research on it, you discover this is horrendous stuff. They served Baalim, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves to them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. You know why the uh, Anglican Church and the United Church and the Roman Catholic Church are spiritually impotent today in our culture? Why people are not getting saved in those churches? Because they have turned away from the Lord God they have served idols in, their, in its place, in God's place. They have their own ideas and their own rituals and, and their own laws. Okay? And now they're doing their thing and the result is spiritual impotence and darkness. 
and people walk into judgment. They bring the judgment of God upon themselves. Same thing is happening today as happened in Israel, except, you know, it's not the Amalekites and the Midianites coming in. It's, uh, it's garbage on TV, and it's the destruction of your home, and the destruction of your marriage, and it's the loss of your biblical priorities, and you are vexed with all your possessions, and you're living for all the wrong reasons, and you're blind and unhappy and rich at the same time. And that's the story of our age. Christians have turned away from God, and they are useless. And you know what? It, it just says they. That includes the people and the priests and the prophets and the kings. It, include, it included every level of society. It wasn't just the people. It was the leaders as well. Now let's move on. Chapter 18 in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 18. We're not going to read this whole chapter, but I'm just going to get you started. Um, actually, the story starts in chapter 17. Judges chapter 17, verse 7. There was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. Uh, let's back up to verse 5. A certain man named Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod. That's a, a plate that a high, only the high priest was supposed to wear with stones on it. It was used in Israel as a means of uh, communication with God. And teraphim, which is false gods, idols, and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Okay? So he made his son a priest. Was that right? What was the standard in the Old Testament? Priests only come from the tribe of? Levi. Levi. Okay, number one. Number two, God makes priests, not men. Okay? Not every Levite is a priest. Some of them were, uh, you know, they carried the furniture. <laughs> only certain highly qualified people from 30 years of age to 50 years of age could serve as priests. This guy made his boy his priest. Okay, so obviously he's breaking most or if not all of the rules. Verse 6, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. He sojourned there where Micah lived. The man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. He went on a trip. He was looking for a place to put his roots. And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he, so, as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, Where did you come from? He said, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah. I'm going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, Dwell with me and be to me a father and a priest. And I will give you ten shekels of silver by the year, a suit of clothes, your victuals. So the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man. And the young man was to him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite. Micah consecrated the Levite. And the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. Does this sort of sound like today? Where everybody does their own thing? The rules don't matter. You can just make, Oh, sure, your, your grandmother, she's a godly woman. Let's make her the Bishop of Edmonton. Same thing is happening here. The rules don't matter. The scriptures are not the standard. It's the ideas of people. Right? And people are so pious and religious and they fold their hands, bow their head, genuflect it behind the pew, you know, and think, we've we got it all together. God will bless us. God is good. God is loving. Right? Same apostate spirit of Antichrist is prevailing today, has prevailed in ancient Israel, this guy made his own priest. He made his son a priest. This guy, hitchhiker, came through. He made him a priest. At least he was a Levite. He got half of it right. He had no right to consecrate him. Right? Let's make a deal. I'll give you this much if you be a priest. God had already explained that the way the priests were to make a living was to live in 48 cities throughout Israel. And they had their own garden plots. And they took their turn going to the synagogue or the temple. 
and the people were to, sp to pay a tithe, 10% out of their income, that tithe went to support the priesthood. Right? That's the way it was supposed to be then. But when the society, you, people, us, all of us, when we degenerate, all of a sudden, the leadership, generally speaking, except for the Elijahs and the Elishas and the Gads and the Nathans, the a few godly men, you know, leadership goes whoosh along with everybody else. This is the problem. Local churches are weak today and ineffective in their communities because the people will not hold their leaders spiritually accountable to the standards of God because the people don't have the standards of God themselves either. They're both responsible. And that's where there's this dynamic of your responsibility, the leader's responsibility, together, in unity. You have to hold to the line that God sets, and you can't make up your own rules. That's what we need here. You need to develop that sense and that spirit. In chapter 18, they continued happily on for a while. We don't know how long it was. In northern Israel, there was a tribe called Dan. They were unhappy with their territory because they were ungodly people and they would not fight their enemies and God didn't give them the victory against their enemies and they didn't have enough space for their grandchildren to have land. So what did they do? They picked up en masse and they headed south through Ephraim to find some land. This is sort of like in the days after the Civil War when the Confederates had lost and there were all kinds of roving bands of Confederate ex-Confederate soldiers and they wreaked mayhem through central United States. In Missouri, there were all kinds of rebel bands of uh, ex-Confederates that went through and they just became uh, like the Jesse Jameses of their day. They just lived off the populace, killing and raping and pillaging and burning and stealing and, you know... It was the fallout from the war. And in the War of Conquest, the Danites had a small plot up north. They, they were not victorious. They went on a, a, a rape, pillage mission. They, the bunch of them just headed south. They came to this guy's house, and they, somebody went in, cased the joint, and they noticed all the teraphim, the gods, on this little shelf that Micah had in his house. And they noticed he had a priest. Well, these people are religious and they're superstitious at the same time. They took Micah, they collected the gods, and they headed down the road. God will bless us. We have a priest. We have these gods. Well, Micah was out of the house. He came home. His priest was gone. His gods were gone. And he got on his horse or his camel and he headed down the road till he caught up with them and he confronted them and said, Hey, what am I supposed to do? I haven't got a priest anymore. You took my gods. And they said, don't speak so loud. Maybe one of these young men here will lose his temper and run you through. Read it. It's like, it's like a soap opera here. <laughs> Does it give you a picture of the kind of spiritual apathy, ignorance, rebellion uh, that was prevalent in the days of the judges? We live in the days of the judges in the 21st century, if you wish. In the church. It's no different. You know, it's not just that spiritual leaders in churches and denominations today are turning away from some of the, the plain ones. Like, it's not just a matter that some of the denominations are accepting women to be their leaders. That is just the frosting on the cake, my friend. Right now, in the United States, the Presbyterians are divided because they're debating the whole question of whether homosexuals should be allowed to be in the ministry. The Lutherans went through this 20 years ago. The Methodists went through it 25 years ago. It's just like they're all rotten to the core. It was no different in Israel. I'm going to read you some verses here if we have time. You know, there was a revival under Joash. 2 Kings chapter 21. No. Um, 2 Kings chapter 12, there was a revival under Joash. He went through. His father was a very wicked king, and his son decided, I'm not going to be like that. He turned away from his father's sins. They uh, got the Bible out, started reading the Bible. He started to repair the temple. He got rid of the sodomites out of Jerusalem. He got rid of the priests. You know what the sodomites are? Homosexuals. Now, there's just something about the way life is that when you turn from God, all of a sudden you have so many other options, alternatives in lifestyle, in leadership, in ways and means of doing things. 
Our culture has long turned away from God. And now we have all the alternatives. Right now in British Columbia, they're having a big fight. I forget what it's about, but in the particulars, but I don't know if it's the United Church or, or uh, some other group is fighting because they're, they reopened the debate to whether or not to uh, either fund or allow homosexuals to be leaders. Is it? It's the Anglican Church, yeah. And they're really worried. You know what's the big problem? The, the, uh, the bishop in Ontario, or the archbishop of the Anglican Church in Ontario, made some comment in the paper that this could decimate the income of the Anglican Church. <laughs> they're worried about money because it's going to split the denomination. That money rules. That's the issue. It's not morality and righteousness and the standards of the Word of God, it's, well, what will happen if 45 dioceses in B B.C. form a new Anglican denomination and turn away from us? We're not going to get that income, and all, we're going to lose all that property, you know. Man. Um, turn with me to, um, well, we're in Judges. I don't want you to turn there, but the next chapter. So, Micah, had his pre he made his son a priest, he picked up a hitchhiker, a Levite, made him a priest. The Danites came through, stole his priest, you know, made him their priest, you know, while they were worshiping false gods. Alright? So this priest was not qualified, he was unspiritual, he was godless, and he didn't deserve to be a leader, but the people made him a leader. And that reminds me of the words of Paul in Second Timothy chapter four. He says, The time will come when people shall turn away their ears from the truth. They will make themselves leaders having itching ears. Paul said, We are in those days, folks. We are in those days. You talk about a challenge for small groups of Christians to find a number of a plurality of qualified spiritual leaders with the desire to serve and with the qualifications to serve, it's getting harder and harder and harder. Because little boys are not taught to have a desire to grow up to be a spiritual leader. Little girls are not taught and trained by their parents to grow up to be a, to be a housewife that loves their children and serves their husband and to be a godly influence on the younger women when they become older women. It's gone! even from the Christian culture, almost gone. How many of you older Christians are mentoring somebody right now? And I'll give you an idea. If you're not mentoring somebody, then you're letting the, the next generation flop. The standard is, is that every generation never goes on holidays. You always stay on the job until the day you croak. Mentoring somebody. Training Maybe not just your kids, but your grandkids and the people on your, you know, that don't have a, a grandfather or a father or a godly mother. That's the biblical standard. And we're losing it. And it's showing up in the church in terms of qualified people to take the reins of responsibility. In Second uh, Kings chapter 12, turn with, turn with me here for a chuckle. Second Kings chapter 12 is actually sad. 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 8. In the time of Jehoash, this man reigned for 40 years. He was a good king. He brought revival. Uh, he said, okay, the temple's falling apart here, like our wall. We need some money here to fix the wall. And I'm not even going to talk about this. I'm not begging for money for the wall. Okay, we've already had five or six hundred dollars donated to fix the wall. It probably won't even take that. It just takes time. <laughs> okay? The point is this. The temple was falling in. And um, so the king said, Okay, let's, let's get a collection going here from all the people so we can get some money here. Why didn't the king donate it? I don't know. But anyway... He wanted the people. Maybe he wanted the people to take responsibility for the temple. So they started collecting money. And look at verse 8. The priests consented to receive no more money of the people, neither to repair the breaches of the house. What does that tell you about the kinds of priests they had? The priests are to work in the temple. This is the location of their responsibility. If they didn't want to fix the temple, they obviously weren't even doing their jobs. They weren't in there. When it rained, you know, the water come pouring in. 
You know, they weren't offering their sacrifices. Obviously, the priesthood was defunct. The sacrificial system was defunct. The national feasts were defunct. The priesthood was just non-existent. They had them, the titular names, but uh, there was they weren't functioning. They didn't even care that the place wasn't was in ruins. Do you care about the body of Jesus Christ? Do you care about the ruins that exist in the local church? Come on, I hope God lights a fire under you <laughs> and, and gives a burden to you for the local church. Because we don't have a temple today. You and I are the temple. You know, we could go on and on. Isaiah. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10. <clears throat> Isaiah lived uh, right at the end, or nearly at the end, and uh, during the days of Hezekiah. And uh, God greatly used Isaiah to strengthen this king, to be faithful. And uh, Isaiah 1.10 is part of the message. The Judah and Jerusalem were like Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 9, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. Isaiah wails. We should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. So here it is. The leaders of the country, you rulers of Sodom, give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of the lambs, or of the he-goats, when you come to appear before me, who required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain, empty oblations, incense and abomination to me, the new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary to bear them. When you spread, spread forth your hands, at, that is, in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you, Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. You know, come back to the standards, he's saying. The rulers of Sodom. The rulers of Israel had let down the bar. You know, the rulers of our country let the bar down, man. They've been letting it down for years. You know, a very significant point was under Pierre Elliott Trudeau. He legalized homosexuality. He brought in the Charter of Rights and gave homosexuals and, and minorities in this country rights that they shouldn't have, morally speaking. Right? And right now, the homosexual lobby in this country is stronger than any other single lobby. They moved in and surrounded uh, Queen's Park in Toronto. In a mile's radius, there are 100,000 sodomites that live around Queen's Park in Toronto. Anytime there's a bill of any kind that comes to the floor of the provincial legislature that has any impact on the homosexual lifestyle, man, they've got 100,000 protesters just like yesterday. You can't get 100,000 Christians together, not on a regular basis, to agitate for righteousness. See, we live in a really bad society. It's just really, really bad. And we are being pressured from outside and we are becoming weak in our hands and our knees. Um, and it's hard for us to hold the standard. It's just hard. It's a battle. Right? Most denominations are letting go. Right? Most denominations have let go. And it's going to be individual little groups of Christians that are going to stand up like the Elijah... Of his day, he thought he was alone. God said, no, no, there's lots. You just don't know them. Right? But Elijah, one man, stood up against 450 false prophets of Baal. You know what the prophets of Baal were? They were castrated men that worked as religious prostitutes in the worship of Baal. And they were terrible influences in the culture. In village after village after village. Elijah said, enough is enough. Let's go back to the standard. It didn't get much better. You know? 
uh, in Elijah's day. I personally don't think it's going to get a whole lot better, but we have to preach it and we have to agitate for it in, in, uh, at the grassroots level. Right? There is something you can do. It's not a hopeless cause. This church can be a vibrant church. And the Baptist church up the road can be a vibrant church if the people will hold to the standard and insist that their leaders be godly men. And that, uh, you know, that we... What are the standards? The standards for the priesthood in the Old Testament were listed in Leviticus 1 through 10. And in Numbers and Deuteronomy. They were listed. The standard is written in black and white. You know what the standards for church leaders are today? 1 Timothy chapter 3. A bishop must be a man. He must have the desire. He must rule his family well. He must be blameless in his lifestyle. In uh, 17 criteria are listed. Okay? And so the standards are there. And we have to hold to the standards whether it's socially acceptable or not. Titus chapter 1 lists them again twice for emphasis. 1 Peter chapter 5, the leadership is not just titular. It's not just, oh yeah, by the book he's got all the qualifications. Where's your heart, buddy? 1 Peter chapter 5, lead by example, lead by humility, lead like Jesus, if you've got the qualifications. So the standards, there's no problem with the standards, we've got the standards. The problem is, is that the will of the people today and the average congregation is non-existent. There's so much social pressure among Christians not to rock the boat. We would rather have peace and comfort than have issues. Well, I'll tell you, friends, as soon as you put your feet up and say, I would rather be comfortable than to have it right, you just lost the battle. You just lost the battle. You want this to be a good church for the next 50 years? Or until Jesus comes? You've got to fight for right. You. You have to be an influence. You've got to insist that the men who are... Um, Appointed here or training for leadership are men that at the, at the minimum level don't violate the stated standards of, and qualifications of the New Testament. It's not just a church problem, it's a family problem. Man, I, I read something so interesting this morning. I, I was looking for something and I found it. God provided it for me. Um, the family and parenting issues... And spousal issues are a perfect illustration of the same principles. You know, what was going on in Israel illustrates in the priesthood and among the populace how bad it got. The people turned away from God, became idolatrous. The priests turned away from the, from the standards. The people accepted a lower standard. The priests hung right in there and they were willing to execute a false standard. Malachi says, what's the matter with you priests? Chapter 2, read it. Here you're, you're willing to come in here and bring... Uh, the lambs that got scurvy and disease, you're offering, you're breaking all the rules. But they were comfortable with it. Maybe that's all they could get. Maybe nobody would bring the good lambs because they could get top dollar for the good ones. We'll bring the sick ones because they're not going to get nothing for them anyway. We'll offer those ones. That the attitude prevails in the churches today. Right? Oh, any old thing will do. Any old thing will do. I think it was uh, Habakkuk wrote and he said to the people, he says, you people spend all your money, you panel the insides of your own dwelling places and the temple is in disrepair. You know, it's a shame that, you know, and i got to be careful because I, I maybe am too busy myself. I don't know, right? But if you lavish, the, here's the, here, I'll say it black and white. If your home is, uh, you know, if you, if you lavish more attention and money on your home, and energy on your home rather than to spiritual things and the support of God's people and missions and the local church, your balance is screwed. What you do at home is a demonstration of your value system. And uh, in Israel, the priests had to flee to their fields because people wouldn't even give them their tithe. It, was, it wasn't just a a leadership problem. Those guys, they got to eat. They got to feed their kids, <laughs> right? I'm not, I'm not moaning and groaning about my situation. I'm happy, all right. I'm talking about them then, all right. It's an illustration of the principle. There's collective responsibility to hold to the standard, so that your leaders, you can encourage your leaders to hold to the standard. And if your leader is bad, turn away. That's the standard of the New Testament church. Hold 
the line on the standards and support godly men and help the young men and encourage your children to grow up to be the men and the women they should be. And it starts in the home. And so I'm going to end.